didn't hit it. Yeah! Hell yeah! Winning crossing the lights, 38849. 38849, but plus one. Oh! Yeah. Plus one where? Where did I He hit was it? doing a happy dance in there and everything, and I ruined it all. I watched it all happen in real time. <laughs> Bastard. But there's something I want to tell you about that cone, Ian. Uh-huh. Guess what? Uh-huh. What? It's real. You hit it. Oh, Sorry, yeah. buddy. Today we'll be continuing our journey with the 87 MR2, lovingly known as the RX AW11, or Mr. Dose for short. Throughout this video series I've been documenting my efforts to prepare this car for rallycross racing. It's been a challenging but almost rewarding process. And in this installment we'll cover all of the hurdles that I've faced to get the MR2 ready for its first event of this rallycross season. The first on my task list was upgrading the rear suspension. If you've followed along with the previous videos, you would know that, but, you know, I don't know who you are. I decided to go with a coilover suspension for more travel and later maybe increased ride height. The stock struts were replaced and I installed adjustable spring perches from Speedway Motors along with uh, 12-inch, 200-pound straight-rate springs from Circle Track cars. The improved stiffness of the rear end is greatly enhanced corner entry rotation on the asphalt and concrete, I assume that it'll only be better in the dirt. Next, I turned my attention to installing the harness bar and uh, tried to install the racing seat and make some other improvements to the interior. I opted for the Techno Toy Tuning harness bar and uh, there's a whole full video on that install along with the race quip harnesses for the driver's side. Although I couldn't use my Corbo FX seats for size constraints and bracket wrongness. The three inch straps on the harnesses provide all the security I need to hold me in place for rally cross runs. Both of those processes, as I said, can be seen in other videos, but moving on to what I've done recently, one of the essential pieces of safety that your uh, steward will look for when teching your car at rally cross is your battery tie down. This particular battery in the MR2 was not so safely secured. I'd say that the metal zip ties were doing their job, but I think I can do a little better. So after removing those danger straps, I thought it would be best to get the battery out of the way entirely. I thought I'd just remove the clamp and, you know, that battery would come right out. Or perhaps after some persuasion, the clamp would come off. And then the battery would come right out. Or maybe some baking soda and water would clean up the terminal. You know, maybe I'd pry on it with a little screwdriver action. Or, oh, you know, PB Blaster could possibly work too. And uh, you know what? How about in the end, we, we'll just go ahead and leave that battery where it is and we'll give it a nice tighten back up on the terminal and now it's, it's, not, it's clearly not going anywhere. Sometimes it's just better to forget it. Then I attempted to try to figure out how I would use the battery tie down bracket that I bought from Amazon and I quickly gave up on that. But I found a nice chunk of seat bracketry that seemed like it might do the trick. Here you can see me using the wheel of death to cut the bracket to length and now we'll enter into what I'm lovingly referring to as hammer vision where you can accurately see what it feels like to be on my bench as I fabricate things with, of course, the most delicate of touches. Oh, God. All hammering and bending complete, the bracket was secured with some hardware that came with the Amazon bracket, and the battery is now rock solid. Fast. We get to bumping, shaking, moving. We might have to retighten some things, but... It ain't coming out of there, that's for sure. It ain't going to tip over. There isn't a safety steward in the land that wouldn't pass this battery through tech with flying colors. Job done? Hmm? Hmm. 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 Yeah. Moving on to the guts of the machine, the engine. Ryan had informed me that there was a knock in the motor, and I, I'm, I wasn't... You know, too, my ear wasn't too keen on understanding what that meant. He said that it was more than likely the rod bearings. I thought, you know, I've never done rod bearings while the motor's still in the car before. Might as well give it a shot. So first and foremost, on my way in, I removed the old motor mounts that were cracked and broken. One bolts out. <laughs> Pow! I'll be dogged. Look at that. Motory mount. I cleaned up the rubber 
and uh, replaced actually the rear mount in its entirety. And then I filled both mounts with 3M window weld polyurethane. That's satisfying schmooage. I left both of the motor mounts on the bench to cure as I moved on to the knock, knock, knocking in the cylinder bore. See what I did? So after tearing off the oil pan and the windage tray and the pickup tube and all, all the things that were in my way, a quick inspection showed that all of the rod bearings were worn. So I ordered new standard OEM size replacement units because clearly this motor has never been rebuilt before. No need to measure. Just, you know, just order. We'll get, we'll get to that. So the bearings arrived and I performed my very first rod bearing swap ever on a motor that's still inside of a car. Now I'd recommend if you're going to do this job that you do it on a busted ass floor of a busted ass shop that, uh, you know, big cracks in the floor uh, on some Harbor Freight jack stands, you know, really do it as sketchy as possible. Make sure that car's, you know, that, that blocks right up in your teeth, you know, right, right in your face here, you know get it, you know, you want to be tasting oil when you do it. You definitely don't need a silly two post or four post lift to do anything like this. No, sir. No, sir. No, ma'am. Even, you know, just get down there and get dirty and hate your life for days. Prepping the pan for installation was next. And that involves scraping and steel wooling the surface of both the windage tray top and bottom and the surface of the pan and the block until everything was spotlessly clean because the RTV cannot bond to other RTV, to old RTV. So if we're gonna put this thing back on the way it came off, which was all RTV, no gaskets, then we're gonna clean those surfaces really well. I like razor blades for the scraping, preferably a long handled paint scraper and then a pointed razor blade to just clean out those holes that you see in the, in, in the pan and in the windage tray. You gotta get all that RTV out of those holes. Anywhere there is RTV, new RTV cannot stick, so clean it out thoroughly. And then the steel wool or a red scrub pad will help you with all the flat surfaces. Of course, there's probably gonna be some pounding involved in getting this thing back to straight because more than likely when you pulled it off, you might have bent it a little bit. So just make sure it's as straight as you can get it, you know, uh, beat on it a little bit with the hammer and make sure it sits flat on your bench and that should be good enough. And then if it's not, it'll leak oil later. Big whoop. Allow me to relay to thee the tale of the oil pan reassembly. I didn't film it because I got real stressed out about how it was going to go. But what I ended up doing was using our TV on both sides, on the um, windage tray to the block, and then on the oil pan to the windage tray. It was hectic. It was awful. But the result is there is an oil pan on the car. So I guess I can't complain too much. So with all of the rod bearings replaced, the windage tray cleaned and replaced, uh, sump pickup tube back in place, and then the oil pan painted, refreshed and put back on the car, uh, I moved my attention onto an oil leak that was coming from the back of the block. You can see here, uh, it's just a bunch of gunk and goo, and it looked like it was coming from the oil filter housing, which made me think that it had a bad gasket on the other side, but it turned out that just the completely wrong size of oil filter had been used on the car. So it was several millimeters too big, and oil was just leaking around it. So it pays to get the right part to put on your car, especially when it comes to, say, an oil filter. So with the motor all buttoned up and <laughs> ready to go, Ready to go. Um, it, moment of truth time, you know? You gotta fire it up. You gotta, you gotta hear what's going, and you know what? We're gonna save that. We're gonna save that moment of truth for a little bit later because um, you'll see. So let's move on to the overstretched and broken parking brake cable. It turned out that the cable was completely snapped at the right rear wheel. I got the new unit in hand, removed the old one, started figuring out how to adjust, fine tune all the things. I played with the adjuster in the front to make sure that it would have an adequate amount of room to adjust later on, and then saw that there was a bit of a fluid leak coming from the rear caliper. So I believe the caliper wasn't adjusted when the brake pads were replaced previously, uh, and that caused it to be overstretched when the parking brake cable was pulled and the parking brake cable snapped because it was going too far. So the piston being out too far was causing the leak, so I dialed the piston back in 
and put everything back together and now the parking brake cable is 100%. This isn't so much for like pulling it and doing sweet drifts and whatnot. Um, it's more for uh, just parking. Been right there on the trailer, not moving. Um, pulling back into my grid spot when I'm racing and having the car stay where I want it if it's on a hill. Just parking brake stuff. So it's, it's fixed now. Suspension, interior stuff, all the engine work, the parking brake cable, battery tie down, all that stuff buttoned up. The day had finally come. And as we mentioned, I'd started the car, but you know, suspense and whatnot. I want you to see for the first time the reveal of my race car for the first rallycross event of the season. Well, <clears throat> here we are. After months of hard work and dedication, putting in at least an hour every two days on the MR2, we come down to the final day of preparation, getting ready for the first KC Rallycross event of the season tomorrow. And, uh, you know, there's some final prep to do, a little bit of wheel changing, and et cetera. And um, the biggest piece of prep is just to make sure that this car is ready to race. I know it's a weird looking MR2, but it's the best MR2 we've got. The MR2 is broken. The bearings that I put in, when I put in the rod caps and the rod caps were loose, rod caps aren't supposed to be loose. And now the motor knocks real bad. So we won't be racing the MR2 tomorrow. Instead, old 50 cent here will be taking a whirl in modified front wheel drive class. So I'm gonna wear the two MR numbers, which you know are not on the car at the moment. Should have done that before we got the filming all together. But you know what? You can't do everything right the first time or this second time or the third time, fourth, fifth, sixth, eighth, twelfth time. Nope. That was not an MR2. And no, I didn't run in the modified rear wheel drive class as the number states with my front wheel drive Honda. Everybody knew that I was running in the front wheel drive class. I've driven that Corolla FX16 that's way back there in front wheel drive class for three or four years now. So I'm pretty well acquainted with driving a front wheel drive car at Rallycross. This particular event took place on a hard pack clay oval in Winston, Missouri at I-35 Speedway, Kansas City Region SCCA. Come on out, race with us. You don't need to, you don't need to put on, you know, like any fancy rally cross tires. You know what I ran? I ran my all season Continental DWS 06 tires. They are wonderful on that dusty clay surface at I-35 Speedway. Basically any tire that's good in the rain is gonna be good at I-35 because you need the grip but you also need a little channeling to get the dust away. So I ran in the modified class, even though I normally run the FX in prepared because all of the competition was in modified class that day. There were two of us that normally run in prepared front wheel drive class uh, and 12 in modified front wheel drive class. So the two of us from prepared just jumped over to modified and we ran with, you know, the, the big tough dogs. I mean, really, you know, you, you just run in modified if you've got your car stripped out or, you know, one reason or the other. And technically the fit would, would fall into that class. It has some motor mounts and some other things that would put it in modified class. It's, you know, it's, it's lowered. It has uh, good shocks on it. It has solid or more solid motor mounts. Um, it has a rear sway bar and no front sway bar, right? So it was, it's, it's set up to handle uh, and, it, and it did great <laughs> against all the competition in the modified front wheel drive class, way better than expected. So I had my whole crew with me. Karen and Miles both got to go for ride alongs. Uh, the boys filmed from the sidelines. You know, we, hopefully, you know, you're looking at some good footage right now. I haven't seen it yet. I don't know how good it is, but hopefully it's not, you know, vertical, it's horizontal. and. Yeah, I'm sure they got some decent footage and they're hopefully they'll become my film crew here moving forward in the future. I really need people to film for me and you know, they're they're about the height of a tripod to begin with. So they they work out perfect. Anyway, you got to love a car that you can drive to the event on the same tires that you're going to run the event with, not have to change a thing when you get there and walk away with a second place finish out of 14 drivers. I am so proud of that little fit. And uh, you know, I honestly think it's a fantastic racing platform. You know, everybody always says uh, in racing for the past 20 years or so, right? Miata is always the answer. What are you gonna do for autocross? Miata, rallycross, Miata, track days, Miata, you know, time attack, Miata, right? Like all of that stuff, everybody says Miata. You give the Honda Fit a chance. 
I'm telling you, you can carry stuff in it. You can carry people in it. I could, I could take four to five people to that event with tires, with extra wheels in the car, and it would be riding really low, but it could be done. And, and that event could be very far away. I'd trust the car to drive there, and I would trust the car to drive in the event, do very well in the event, and then come home. I've driven this car in autocross and rallycross. It's so much fun. So give it a chance. I don't think I'll ever be without a Honda Fit in my life. It may not always be my race car, but it might be my children's race car or somebody else I know's race car or something. And man, if I could put a K-Swap in it, that Mini that beat me by eight seconds or so on the day wouldn't stand a chance. Sorry, Eric. I love you. Hot Hatch Racing. Shout out. Anyway, we had a great day. The car drove all the way home as expected. And waiting there for us when we arrived, Mr. Dose. Still in the shop, waiting for his day in the sun. The only variable now is me. Can I get all the work done to replace the rod bearings in time for the second event of the season? That's going all the way back in again through the oil pan, the window tray, et cetera, and then coming all the way back out and assembling it all. Can I, can I get all that done before that second event? I really don't know. I mean, honestly, it's on the trailer right now and it has its stickers on. So that should be a pretty good sign to you that I, I might have done it. And also that I don't make videos very fast. So deal with it. This is B. <laughs> so if you had a good time watching this and you enjoy what I'm making, please give this video a like. Subscribe to the channel, maybe click the notification bell. It really does mean a lot to do all of those things. I know people say it all the time, but like, I can't get these videos into the algorithm unless you help me out. So if you think I'm doing a good job and you like what I'm doing, you want to support the channel, I don't make any money from this. I'm just doing this because I kind of want to document the stuff that I do. I'll try to keep you in the loop of this season of racing in the RX AW11. And a little foreshadowing, there will be racing. My, my goodness, yes. Much racing. Well, thanks a lot for sticking around and I will see you next time. I can't really walk away because I'm tied to the thing and there's a car over in the driveway next door and they're just staring at me and trying to figure out what I'm doing. So I'm just gonna, just gonna walk around here and turn off the thing. Oh God, that bee's back. Jesus.